There's only one rare herb minnow, the Mississippi silvery minnow. This is the one I put on the practical to kill everybody. But again, it doesn't look like, it, it looks like everything and nothing all at once. Looks very shiner-like, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <coughs> Unlike the brassy minnow, its fins are very pointed. The brassy minnow fins are triangular. They're not as rounded as, as the, the blood-nosed minnow or the fatted minnow, but they're pointed. Body is relatively silvery, hence the name. Um, and you'd only, you'd only find them in um, larger rivers like the Mississippi, Lower Wisconsin, the Black, the Chippewa. I guess looks like they're in the tectonic system. So there are some oddballs that don't really fit in any of these categories. They tend to look more like chubs and minnows than anything else. The stone rollers and the sucker mouth minnow. Sucker mouth minnow you don't encounter much up here kind of at the northern end of its range. South of here, you get a job, you know, in Illinois or Indiana, uh, Ohio, sucker mouth minnow is very common. Um, stone rollers are relatively common as well. And we have two species here. Both of them tend to have these characteristics. Notice that even a non-breeding individual has sort of a speckling appearance to it. Uh, uh, a relatively faint lateral stripe. Uh, they, this one doesn't show it super well, but they often have a sort of a blaze through the dorsal fin. Both species of stone roller have this. Um, here's a male in breeding colors with tubercles as well. But stone rollers, you guys remember what a stone roller is? Why do they roll stones? what's on them. Parafighting, right? Algae? They scrape algae. They have a wedge-shaped cartilaginous ridge on their lower jaw. And so that sets them apart from a lot of other things. Hard to see in the field. So you kind of have to, this is one of those things where you have to get a feel for, for them. They'll, they'll be left over in your, in your buckets after you're sorting out the stuff that's easier to identify. Here's the kicker, though. We've got, if we look at the range maps between the central and the large-scale stone rollers, see they're, they're kind of mutually exclusive almost. They don't overlap a lot. They hybridize between there. And the way to definitively tell them apart from one another is that the large-scale stone roller has fewer than 48 lateral line scales, and the, the central stone roller has more. 48. And you can kind of do that in the field, especially if you have okay eyesight, and the, the specimens are fairly large. But it's it's um, kind of a problem. Uh, I don't know if you've been over there by the uh, the Amherst Brewery, but uh, right there, across the street from the uh, Tomorrow River Supper Club, which is called something else now, is that. Uh, Good old fashioned fish hatchery that's right on the water. Guy has a lot of live bait there. He did a lot of importing of sane mixed minnows and stuff from all over the state. So there's a whole bunch of stuff from Tomorrow River that I best I'm, I'm betting is is introduced by him. So this central stone roller population is in contact with that large scale stone roller. We've seen out collecting presumed hybrids between the two. So that's not very fun. Suckermouth minnow has the body of a minnow. There's a lateral stripe, there's a caudal spot, um, cylindrical in cross section, but it has very fleshy lips. They look just like um, they look just like the lips of a sucker. You could potentially confuse them with a with a juvenile red horse or white sucker. Um, at first glance. And as I said, though, they're not super common up here. They're relatively rare up here. Um, bases have fine scales, usually more than 65 lateral line scales, sometimes as many as 100, depending on the species. Um, they often have cryptic coloration. They can have very vibrant 
breeding colors, though, um, some have barbels, some do not. Generally speaking, they're in flowing waters, but the key is the fine scale. Fine scales make it a face. So when you look at it, they look kind of like you know a, a, a trout or a salmon. Very, very um, um, smooth texture, I guess is the, the word I'm looking for. Um, some of them are extremely beautiful, especially right now. If we went out, if we went out today and caught some of these in the, in the clover, they would look like the males would look like that. Very beautiful. Um, Black-nosed dace and the next species, the long-nosed dace, have very protruding snouts. And the snouts are connected to the upper lip. There is no boundary between the snout and the upper lip. That's called a, a frenum, which we use when we're teeing these things out. But rhinichthys literally means nose fish, so I tell my students to remember they have a big, bulbous snout, a nose-like feature. Um, Black-nosed dace are one of the few larger fish where the lateral stripe goes all the way through their face. No black nose, because the stripe is there. Make it all the way through their face. So that's something that, that very few, um, very few larger minnow, chub, dace-like entities are gonna display. <coughs> Super widespread though in flowing waters. Alongside these guys, these guys can live in the fastest stuff. You get a ripple that's moving you know, 10, 12 miles an hour, they're, they're in there. I don't know how. I may take advantage of, of hiding behind rocks and things. But we get them, we get them in the fastest moving water. Uh, and breeding males can have bright red lips um, and fin bases. Look at that overhang. Very, very bulbous. The long nose days is a good name for this critter. No lateral stripe. So if you see something with a fairly heavy snout, that does not have a strong lateral stripe, um, likely is a, a long those days. Notice that the scales are small on these, right? Bases have small scales compared to what you saw back here in the, the land of the chubs and the minnows and the stone rollers. Those are large scales. Uh, not super common down here, but up north, quite common. The fine scale days, probably um, the the smallest scales. You could confuse them potentially with a, um, a juvenile trout, you know, especially if, you, if you're in an area where the trout don't have really strong par marks. You can barely see those scales. Breeding colors are extremely vibrant. Most times you're going to find them like that. In our neighborhood, the only time I've ever gotten these was in the Tomorrow River system. Um, I don't mean we got them in the blue one too. Doesn't matter, they all flow into the wolf anyways. Uh, in terms of, of um, indicator species for good habitats, good water quality, cold water, high oxygen, these are right up there with, with brook trout and sculpin and things like that. So having these around is a, is a good thing. You were talking about the Lost Creek. Loaded. We still have some in the tank from whenever that was. Were you on that trip? <coughs> Three, four years ago when we went with Iserman, were you even here? I was not. You were here, yeah. So no, I've, I've been shopping on the Lost Creek and it's full of those things. There's brookies in there, sculpins, all kinds of nice stuff. Um, Northern Red Belly Days, Southern Red Belly Days have ranges that are similar to the, um, the large scale stone roller and the central stone roller, where they're, they're kind of complementary. Do you see that? But again, our friend over here at the stupid bait store is over there. He's introduced Southern Red Billy Dace into the Tomorrow River where it crosses, or where it's crossed by Highway 10 um, by Blue Colts Road is a great place to see these in breeding color. Uh, both Northern and Southern Red Billy Dace have similar color patterns, particularly in breeding color. Notice the females even get colored up. The females are these yellow ones. During the year, they're just sort of a tan, a beige. Northern and Southern, Southern Red Belly Days have two lateral stripes. Very few things on your list here have two lateral stripes. So two lateral <coughs> stripes should get you to, oh, I forgot to change the name. This should say Crosomus. Look at here, I've got Foxina. So two lateral stripes, uh, inbreeding condition, bright, bright yellow fins, bright orange, red belly. And now here's the, here's the kicker. You're going, oh my gosh, this looks really similar to that. 
Look at the snout. On the southern red bellied dace, the mouth is relatively horizontal, and the snout, especially in larger individuals, is longer than the eye diameter. If we flip to the northern, see how the northern's got a pug nose, the mouth is oblique, and the snout is short, shorter than the eye diameter. Of course, we're looking at mid-sized fish, young ones, it gets a little gray, and these can hybridize as well. What's really cool is these can hybridize with these and these. So you get these three-way hybridization events that require backcrossing, obviously, and you can get genetics that are completely screwed up. You get aneuploidy, you can get like triploid individuals and stuff. It's, it's really an interesting phenomenon. Okay, so that's the southern red belly dace. Red side dace is, a, is an interesting one for us. If you get a job right here, um, in central Wisconsin, this is sort of a stronghold. There's only two species in the genus Clonostomus. Both of them have really huge mouths. You see that? Those mouths are just gigantic. And um, Clonostomus means long mouth, essentially. But what's cool about it is that there's species of special concern that can be ridiculously common locally by us. So we're right in the hotbed um, area. And if you know anything about these streams here, like Mill Creek and the Rib River. Um, you know, there's a lot of bedrock close to the surface in that part of the state. The streams are cold, they're groundwater fed, but they don't move very fast. It's a really unique kind of habitat. And, and again, our, our guy has been active at spreading species throughout. There's some in that river, the Draw River as well. Um, I'm not sure, I can't remember what John Lyons said. He, I think he said that, that uh, these were likely Based on, uh, based on the introductions as well. But it's a really interesting fish. Also indicative of really good water quality. You know, a cold, um, high oxygen, low, low pollutants. The pearl dace is, it used to be in the same genus as the creek chub. So it's like a, it's a, a creek chub wannabe, look-alike. Now it's in its own, well, there's some, several other margariscus species. They've recently been, um, Margariscus, Margariscus has recently been split up so that Nactriebi is a new name. But you're going you're gonna to see this right alongside creek chub in flowing waters, relatively common, and you'll, you'll be thrown by it because it has a dusky lateral stripe like the creek chub does. It has a caudal spot like the creek chub does. It's lacking a barbel, but it's, it's missing this pigment patch here and its scales are way more fine. So if I see something that looks like a creek chub and is lacking the, the pigment at the base of the dorsal fin and has fine scales, it's a pearl dace. But they're right alongside each other. Pearl dace can get very large. Creek chubs won't have this breeding coloration. Speaking of which, if you haven't had this guy to give a talk, have you had Con Conrad Schmidt give a talk? He's, he's like the John Lyons of Minnesota. And he's really big in NAMPA. He'd be a good speaker. Not that it matters to you because you're graduating. But <laughs> you get Conrad Schmidt to talk about all kinds of stuff. They're doing, Conrad Schmidt's doing all kinds of non game fish reintroductions, which is cool. They would never let us do that in Wisconsin because of VHS. We've asked. Okay. This is where.